So, uh, Elden Ring is out. As you have undoubtedly heard, from Software's newest Souls-like has released to thunderous praise, quickly becoming one of the highest reviewed games of all time. And one of its biggest positives is real currently stated to be the open world, which many see as a breath of fresh air in an otherwise notoriously stagnant genre. But how is that possible? How did FromSoft do this in their first open world title? Let's chat! Oh, also, if you're worried about spoilers, all good. I will only show stuff from Limgrave and the Weeping Peninsula, two areas you'll have access to right at the start, so this should not be too egregious. What would you say defines an open world game in the modern conception? Is it Ubisoft towers, map markers, side quests, crafting systems? I would say it's all of those things, but to put it into one single phrase, Modern open worlds are defined by a crippling inability to let the player miss anything. Many modern games operate on the idea that a player should see most or even all of their content in a single playthrough, be it through the use of markers, easily findable side quests, or generous world guidance, it is very hard to miss out on most of the content in a game like Assassin's Creed. This makes sense as developers want the work they put in to actually show to the player base. A game failing because all of its best content is easy to miss is an absolute nightmare scenario. However, if you listen to players and reviewers of these types of games, you will quickly notice that what sticks with people is not the 100 copy-pasted points of interest or the 75 enemy camps, but rather odd, handcrafted situations that feel personal, unique, and missable. The Witcher 3 still has people uploading videos of rare scenarios and side quests, all of which garner praise and excitement every time. I think that is because open world games promise a sense of wonder, a sense of exploring the unknown and finding something worthwhile, but the increasingly checklist-like design of many open worlds pretty much entirely chokes that potential. Even The Witcher 3, for all its praiseworthy miserable story beats, falls into this issue with its infamously numerous question mark spots, which make it so that you always know when you'll find a point of interest, as well as the dotted line GPS that helps you find uninteresting, efficient ways through this gorgeous landscape without ever looking at it. The act of existing in this and many other worlds becomes a farce, because you never need to engage with it on an immersive level, you might as well play the game with nothing but the HUD visible. The intense mechanization of open worlds has thus made these games much more convenient, but to a point where you build no relationship to the world around you, making any and all discoveries unexciting and kind of vapid. Enter Elden Ring. If modern open world games suck the soul out of their worlds by being too afraid of the player missing content, then Elden Ring, and all FromSoft games to a certain extent, are the complete opposite. Limgrave and the Weeping Peninsula are home to around 30-ish bosses. But do you know how many are mandatory and thus you are railroaded into doing? Two. This extreme level of optionality to the game world is the first thing that sets Elden Ring apart. You are free to do basically anything, truly free to do anything, and the game couldn't care less if you just rush right past all the beautiful vistas and side activities. Hell, even the series' first proper tutorial is completely optional, only accessible if you, at the start, don't go through the obvious door to freedom, but instead take the hell. This very quickly communicates to the player they should never feel forced to do, well, anything in the game. Most stuff is optional, so if anything seems like a chore, don't do it, or come back later. While this is a mentality that all open world games at least superficially attempt, the sheer volume of optional stuff here makes Elden Ring very effective in this regard. This is also where one of FromSoft's personal strengths come into play. They are well known to be incredibly cryptic and secretive in how they hide entire mechanics and areas in their games, so players familiar with them are generally a lot more on board with this optional content. But this aspect, the immense optionality of most of the game, is only the first ingredient to Elden Ring's open world medicine. Now it needs to properly ease the player into nonetheless discovering some of the content, so that they can have fun and start making choices where to go. 
The way a Ubisoft game would do it is to just litter the map with objective markers, which is known to induce choice anxiety. Not really a feeling you want to give your player immediately right off the bat. Instead, Elden Ring treats its map very carefully. At the beginning, the map is essentially use and featureless, as you have to fill it out using map fragments you find at obelisks. These obelisks are coincidentally the only marked object on your locked map. Once you do unlock the map, it doesn't really resemble the checklist buffets of other games, it's more like a still painting with only the grace sites and your player marked. This is where Elden Ring pulls one of its simplest and cleverest tricks. The areas of interests are indeed marked, but they are all painted onto the map in the same art style. They don't show up as a listed place, you can select them to be visible on your compass, but they are there. Only after you discover them do they turn into clearly distinguishable vector icons. This tiny change has massive benefits. Instead of just mindlessly working away at the millions of icons of other games, Elden Ring has you explore an unknown painted map that only through a fair bit of scrutiny reveals its secrets. For example, this black hole with a red rim always marks a mineshaft where you can gather upgrade materials. This is a great middle point between letting your players explore the unknown and still giving them the tools to figure out what place is worth visiting. And this is then lastly elevated by the actual world design itself. A core difficulty of designing interesting open worlds is that they take a tremendous amount of resources to make due to size inflation. To call a game open world, the playable open area has to be pretty sizable generally, but that size ends up causing a massive time investment if you want the world to feel handcrafted. This is a problem because making any game, period, is already a massive task without the fat world map to create. So making open world games becomes an exercise in compromise. How many things can we reskin and copy paste without it negatively impacting the experience? The result is a list of activities that often feels fairly samey between categories. You either find an enemy settlement, a loot area, maybe a small dungeon, etc, etc. This categorical similarity also extends to the rewards you get from these activities. Since a lot of open world games focus on combat and gear, the rewards that the world markers give you often end up being new weapons or armor. But because making that world and the game itself already are huge tasks, making a bunch of unique and interesting rewards on top of that often ends up being shafted. So when you find a new set of swords in The Witcher, they will always look, play, and move roughly the same as your starting swords. They are sometimes bigger, stronger, and maybe do poison damage, but they hardly stand out enough to feel like a genuine game changer, and again, it's hard to build a relationship with any of your equipment and any of the rewards you get. This is where Elden Ring's unique position as a FromSoft game really shines. Because FromSoft is perhaps the only company sitting on an actual mountain of finished, easily reusable animations and visual effects for hundreds of unique weapons and weapon archetypes. While nerds on Twitter might dislike asset reuse for no reason, the reality of game dev is that reusing what you can is crucial with larger projects. And when you, as a company, have spent the last 10 years building an extensive library of combat and weapon animations, you'd be daft not to take advantage of that. So, because they already have an easily integratable array of worthwhile, unique rewards, and already functioning gameplay systems and mechanics, a massive load is taken off the shoulders of the developers, which now can focus that energy and time on the actual world itself, turning it into a real star. For starters, the world is designed the way a FromSoft level is designed, with a meticulous eye for player learning. So Limgrave is a giant playground with a northernmost stronghold. This is where the area's only mandatory content is. Thus, you are essentially asked to go north. You see the castle up in the distance and you understand, alright, that's where I'm going. However, immediately north of the very first save point lies the Tree Sentinel a massively overpowered boss that has already cemented itself as a notorious newbie <laughs> killer. This is the most important early lesson the game teaches you. You can just leave. You can just circumvent the Tree Sentinel and go on your merry way. So the player now, instinctively, bouncing off the Tree Sentinel, understands that content is not forced upon them, and they can choose when and how to tackle it. Then, once the player unlocks three overworld save points, no matter where they are, they will be given both their very own Grace Maiden and a horse to ride on. 
This further communicates the freeform nature of the game. Do whatever you want, and more often than not, rewards will come to you just through exploring. So far, very positive. But if you actually decide to attempt the story content immediately, you will swiftly be repelled by Margit, the first mandatory boss. He is really tough, already a contender for one of the most meme difficulty spikes in the entire series. This is by design. Margit is meant to bounce the player off his northbound path and encourage them to think where else to go. If north doesn't work, south must do. And would you look at that, there is an entire additional landmass to the south, the Weeping Peninsula, full with a demo dungeon meant to prepare you for the northern castle. As I said, I will not spoil you on later areas, but trust me, this bounce off go explore structure remains consistent throughout the game, where difficult encounters are essentially used as a guide rails to present a path that is recommended but not mandatory. If you want to run to market and immediately rush through the mandatory content, you can do that, but he will still be a tough battle and he will repel most new players. This approach essentially accommodates both types of players. The recommended type players, the ones that try to tackle things by the way of feeling out the game design, and the hard-headed players, the ones who decide, no, I will spend 5 hours dying to this boss, thank you very much. This is supported by a new difficulty heat map system, where certain areas are invisibly designated as especially challenging by the developers and are therefore equipped with some extra amenities. So, for example, you will find Stakes of Marika, which serve as alternative respawn points. While they cannot be used for leveling up and the like, they will allow you to return into the action from a more advantageous and usually closer position. Meanwhile, obelisks mark your HUD with this rune, which allows you to summon helpful spirits while in its range. And because these are physical elements within the game world, their presence can be seen, understood, and then used to make decisions all within the diegesis of the game world. Just by choosing which content to tackle, the player forges that ever-important relationship with the world, because they have to engage with it on a textural level. They have to be present and aware of the world around them, not just their HUD, although the HUD markers do exist. But that relationship would not matter if the world wasn't filled with interesting things to discover. We mentioned the myriad of cool rewarding weapons and things to find, but if the locations where you can find them are boring, it's not really a win, at least not completely. And this is one of open world's biggest pitfalls. The side content is often simply not interesting. It is either clearly copy-pasted prefab content with no spice of variety, or at best, it's good content that often detracts from the narrative stakes of the game. Famously, no matter how good a side quest in Fallout 4 gets, it will always feel off to do random stuff for hours while the main plot tells you to hurry up and find your son. Even The Witcher 3, a game with notoriously great side quests, isn't free from this problem. You're supposed to be finding Ciri, looking for clues all over, and yet you're essentially just doing errands for people all the time. This ludonarrative conflict is something that games have always struggled with. Elden Ring avoids both of this mostly. The game does have some clear copy-pasted locations, namely the mini dungeons very obviously use prefabs and tile sets, and some bosses are more reoccurring than I would like. But the game does something clever. It uses the extra resources it gained from reusing the Soulsborne library to give almost every location some unique twist, some little spice to make it more interesting by just adding a minuscule amount of thought into it. Let's explain this one with an example. So, early on in my personal playthrough, I saw this drawing of a few houses and thought, alright, I have played a few games before in my life, this is surely just some enemy camp that I can clear out for some runes and maybe some loot. So I made my way through the peninsula and immediately, things were off. The first enemies I encountered weren't soldiers or even humans at all. Instead I was greeted by giant rats, like I had seen before, but with these glowing fiery eyes they had never had prior to this. Whenever they'd hit me, I'd be also afflicted by a status effect that was entirely unknown to me. As I pushed further into the village, I did eventually encounter humans, but they were… odd. They were mostly passive, just standing around and staring into a bonfire. When provoked, they too have those fiery eyes and some even shoot fire. 
Once that's dealt with, I received a flame spell in the village church that allows me to shoot fiery snakes from my eyes like some of the villagers could. So what happened is that these rats carried some sort of cursed fiery frenzy into the village which quickly took hold of everyone. I think. Vati hasn't made his videos yet. Either way, what I want you to notice is how by just adding a tiny amount of unique assets, namely glowing eyes, into the situation and putting in additional thought in how to arrange the environment, this random location instantly became more memorable to me than 90% of all other open world points of interest. This place told a tiny, super simple story and rewarded it with a cool and unique reward, and just through that, it stands apart. It is literally just a clever reuse of assets. All of this are elements that are in the game otherwise, but by recombining them into an interesting new mix, you create uniqueness, you create interest. And again, I will not spoil you on any other discoveries, but let me say that this is the average level of Elden Ring's point of interest quality. And all of this also circumvents the old narrative conflict of open world games we mentioned earlier. FromSoft has a very cryptic and understated approach to storytelling, and so there is essentially no urgency from a narrative standpoint, only exploration in the name of eventually getting strong enough to become the Elden Lord. There are no long-winded quest lines that you have to follow bit by bit, you just kind of stumble into them the same way you stumble into interesting little villages like these, and because of that, the game never pulls you out of your experience, the game never tells you, hey, Cool that you're doing this, but your daughter is in danger. You're on your way exploring this world, and the exploration, the journey, is your story. So, by making clever use of their pre-existing asset library, by carefully controlling how much explicit information about the world to give the player at any point, and by marrying their notoriously cryptic storyline with unique, handcrafted overworld locations, FromSoft creates a world that respects the player's agency and seeks to entrance instead of overwhelm. Elden Ring doesn't have to flex its size from minute one, because it trusts you to find your own fun in your own way. It wants you to explore, to grow, to wonder, to die, to die, to die, to die until you're ready to stand before the Elden Ring. As always, thank you all for watching, and a big thank you to all our patrons, including Fictionape, Sini, Courage, Iron Camel, Jameson Tate, Ludenther, Paracha, Perro Scocco, Project Iceman, Mr. Meander, and Geo. So, uh, yeah, see you for the next video. Bye bye, and take care.